Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, Smarter Working uh, webinar on the theme of productivity. Um, I'm going to hand you over in a moment to uh, our host this morning, Jonathan Booth. Uh, Jonathan is a director of Journey4, an expert in uh, customer-driven growth and transformation. Uh, but just, just before that, a, a couple of um, housekeeping points to begin with. Um, the, the webinar will be recorded this morning. Uh, uh, the recording will be made available after the event. Um, also, the speakers are making their slides available to you after the event as well, so we'll be circulating those. Um, just your attention to the Q&A uh, function. Uh, please leave any questions you have for the speakers in the Q&A bar at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on how your screen is set up. Um, and we'll, we'll pick them up from there. Uh, if you do want to share any comments or, or chat, there is a, a, a chat function as well that you can use to share uh, notes uh, to, to either myself or uh, the other attendees. Um, and in terms of uh, timings, we'll be running out to 10 to um, 11, so 50 minutes uh, through the speakers and the Q&A at the end. So thank you for joining us, and I'm going to hand you over to Jonathan Booth. Thank you, Stuart. Morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for taking the time to join us. And welcome to us, Stuart says, this, this webinar on smart working productivity. This is a second of four webinars. Um, the first theme last month was on leadership and culture. Today, we're talking about productivity related issues, and then we'll have two more in the new year that will talk about work-life balance and communication. And these themes emerged from some work we did earlier in the, uh, the first lockdown period, back in the summer, uh, the hazy summer, where we uh, a, a group of our contacts and clients got together, 21 businesses across 13 sectors, and we talked about the changes businesses are making during lockdown and how businesses are adapting their business models and what the pros and cons of those changes were. So the purpose of these webinars is to share some of the best practice that businesses have developed over the last six to nine months in response to the, uh, the pandemic. And um, obviously that will give us some, hopefully some insight into how businesses have prospered, as well as some of the, uh, the learnings. As Stuart mentioned, obviously those uh, learnings will be shared with you after the webinar as well. So there's no need to take notes. You will get a copy of the, uh, of the slides. So as with all our webinars, we've got three speakers. So I want to actually start by thanking our three speakers for volunteering to uh, be involved today. We have uh, Alison McKenna, who is an non-exec director at Chesterfield Royal Hospital, Richard Price, Chief Operating Officer at Bristol Water, and Alan Bowman, who is a director at one of our partners, The Buzz. So I'll introduce the three speakers in turn. They're all going to talk for, for 10 minutes, and then I'll ask you to put any questions on the Q&A button. And at the end, we'll have a session where we'll start to, uh, to go through any questions that are arising. So I'm going to start off with, uh, with Alison. Um, Alison, as I said, is non-exec director at Chesterfield Royal Hospitals. Alison's got a background in chain transformation generally, um, and has several non-exec roles. So she has lots of different uh, perspectives, not just in the health sector. Health sector is one of her uh, areas of expertise, but it's quite a broad range of uh, specialisms and backgrounds that uh, Alison brings to the party. And Alison is going to talk about some of the productivity benefits and changes they've seen in Chesterfield Hospital particularly with a relation to um, outpatient appointments. So uh, thank you, Alison, for making time to join us and over to you. Thank you, Jonathan, and uh, thank you for the introduction. So um, my name's Alison McKinna and I'm a non-exec director at Chesterfield Royal Hospital. Um, I'm sure you've all been aware uh, from press reports, the stresses and strains that uh, the NHS has been under. But um, one of the potential consequences that has happened is about how we've changed outpatient appointments. And what I was going to talk about today is how we've managed that transition process from uh, virtual outpatient appointments being at 4% of volume up to 86% of volume um, and implementing that change within three to um, four weeks. Um, I've got something in the chat that says um, that you can't hear me. Can you hear me? Is that OK? Um, we can hear you okay, Alison. Um, okay, I'll, I'll carry on. There was a comment yeah. in the chat that said uh, uh, someone couldn't hear I'll, me. I'll, I'll, I'll get a message to Jane who's struggling to hear. hear. Yeah. Okay, yeah. lovely. Thank you. So um, what I was going to talk about today is really how COVID has impacted the outpatient processes 
um, how we've changed things, but also how we're going to embed that into the future and how do we keep our focus on, on the patient. So um, I've got a number of different slides. Um, so just moving on. If Stuart can press the button. <laughs> You'd be there. There we go. OK, so um, so this slide is a little bit uh, busy, but over on the right hand side, you'll see a, 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 a blue lozenge that says our aim that within the NHS, we want to deliver 30 percent of all outpatient appointments virtually over the next three years. So that was the stated aim at the beginning of this year pre COVID. And as you can see, the results are that we've now moved to 80%, 86% of all out outpatient appointments being done virtually. So, um, so there's something about setting an audacious goal, isn't there? Um, we've been very fortunate that we have something called the Royal Academy of Improvement, which is a team of people who have been training um, individuals within the organisation over the last two years on change management techniques and how to think about change. And the, um, the diagram on the right that says aim, objective, method, challenge and results is the methodology that they've been training into the organisation. So moving into COVID and the changes we wanted to make, we were very fortunate that we'd already got a centralised specialist team. But then we had a number, over 100 individuals who'd been trained on change and how to, um, how to uh, implement it. So um, when COVID happened, we looked at outpatients. Obviously, our clinicians wanted to carry on interacting with patients and patients still needed to be seen um, and to interact with their clinicians. But being able to unable to physically come onto the hospital site was a real challenge. So um, what we did was we deployed virtual technology. We redesigned some of the clinical pathways so that all new and follow up uh, outpatient appointments went to telephone or video conference. Um, we put in clinical assessment services. So all of our wait lists and all of our patient lists um, were regularly reviewed and prioritized based on clinical need. Um, and particularly cancer has been in the news. Um, we implemented a virtual cancer multidisciplinary team, which is a number of different specialisms coming together to review cancer, so cancer patients so that um, people with cancer would not be negatively impacted through COVID. So just opening up some of the, the data and some of the monitoring that we can demonstrate, um, the following slide has got a, a diagram of some of our performance. So um, we use st statistical process control to manage our, uh, many of our processes within the hospital. Um, and this graph just shows you this significant and dramatic change from face-to-face -face consultations to, um, to seeing virtual consultations being fully implemented. Um, and, you know, it's all about teamwork. It's all about uh, working with clinicians um, and the support staff, but also satisfying what patients need um, and being driven by that patient need. Um, so again, just moving on Stuart for us. So um, once you've made that change and you've seen that dramatic change, how do you keep it embedded in your organisation? Um, and for us, that has been about ongoing um, monitoring. So you can see the table on the right hand side is now looking at data during May, listing out each specialism and how they're doing on uh, conducting virtual appointments. So um, we regularly review anything that's below 80%. Um, and ask, are we doing the appropriate thing clinically? Um, and should we be doing more virtual appointments? Um, we've been looking at uh, digital appointments and whether they're clinically appropriate. So there are some things like gynecology that's quite difficult to do virtually. Um, so you have to, have to bring people into the hospital. Going forward, we're setting ourselves targets about how we want to um, maintain this change and actually redesigning infrastructure and ways of working. So how do we, um, change the infrastructure and the real estate within the hospital to enable good quality virtual um, uh, appointments supported by tech. Um, and we've been uh, prioritising areas of greatest clinical need for video consultation over telephone because that's what the patient feedback is that they, they'd like seeing somebody even if it's just on screen. So um, moving on to the next slide, any, any change has some um, 
um, consequences. Um, and these two consequences were things that um, we hadn't planned for. They weren't benefits that we were looking for through in implementing virtual appointments. But we can see in the data that we've had a decrease in the number of patient cancellations and also a decrease in the did not attend um, a, an appointment. So um, when you're implementing organisational change, sometimes you affect other parts of the system that you maybe didn't intend to. And that can be positive, as in this case, or it can be negative, but it's it's something to uh, to look out for. So um, moving on, Stuart. So um, so for me, the the so what is what does this tell you that you can take into your own um, organisation? And I was doing a webinar earlier this year, and I said, you know, the main difference about implementing virtual consultations was the gate of avoidance was closed. Um, the, the, the ability of people to say, no, I don't want to do that, disappeared because of COVID. Um, and it's about how do you challenge the usual way? So what are the processes within your organisation that are the usual way? And is there a difference, a different way that you can get from A to B in a completely shifted process? Um, the ability to change the hospital at speed was because it was um, a very emotional driver for the consultants because they still wanted to care for patients. Um, and so there was a real hook there that we could use um, because they were so driven to want to carry on caring for people. Um, but also there was a, a patient driver because um, our experience during COVID is people are so frightened about coming onto the hospital site. Um, so how could we match those two emotional um, drivers to create a brand new process? So as a demonstration of, of, of people not wanting to come on site, attendances at A&E when COVID uh, lockdown happened were, were just through the floor. Nobody was coming into A&E. Um, so we needed to find a way to reduce fear for the patients. Um, and I think what the challenge is, is how do you change the definition of process success? So what does success look like from the patient's point of view, the hospital's point of view, the clinician's point of view, and challenge all of that uh, into doing things in a different and new way. So COVID has helped us change some of the hospital processes very quickly, and we know that it works, and we know that it doesn't have any clinical disadvantage. So we intend to keep embedding it as a way of operating going forward. So I hope that gives you a little bit of insight into what's been happening at Chesterfield. Um, and I think that we're going to be handling questions uh, at the end of the sessions, but I'll hand back to Jonathan. Um, but hopefully that's given you an insight into what's been happening within the NHS and within my hospital in particular. That's great. Thank you, Alison. And uh, thank you very much for being bang on time as well. I'm very impressed. Uh, so bang on the 10 minutes. Um, interesting, I'm just gonna, uh, I do like the gates of avoidance being players statement I think that's great. Um, the work we've done in the NHS in the past I know there's been resistance to uh, some of the uh, from staff and from customers patients around uh, virtual uh, virtual appointments etc so I think that's, that's fantastic it's encouraging to see those uh, significant changes you made. I should just say that there were some problems with the the audio there so apologies if you've had intermittent problems I certainly couldn't hear Alison for certain parts but uh, only momentarily. So I hope the majority of you could hear that and that the, uh, the audio remains solid for the main of the, uh, of the session. Um, obviously, please put on the chat if, if there's a problem. And um, before we move on to our next speaker, just to remind you, as Alison said, that if you have got any questions, please use the Q&A facility at the bottom of the screen there to uh, flood those questions up. And then we can uh, ask those questions of the speakers at the end. So, moving on, thanks again, Alison. Moving on to uh, Richard. Richard Price is Chief Operating Officer at Bristol Water. Um, despite the fact Richard works in the southwest, has worked in the south on the, in the water business for over 20 years. He's a proud Yorkshireman, which I'm delighted to have to flag up now. Um, and Richard is going to talk about productivity issues, particularly relating to field and uh, field performance and productivity. So again, Richard, thank you for taking time to uh, talk to us. Over to you. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. And good morning, everybody. Hopefully everyone can uh, hear me and the slides have popped up. Uh, they're certainly on my screen. So I'm going to talk about exactly as Jonathan said, uh, field and office uh, productivity and performance during COVID and the journey we're on. First to say, uh, you know, Bristol Water, our strapline is what it's what we're made of. 
and obviously simply cannot stop at the time of COVID and national emergency where hygiene is so important, the water supply has to continue. So uh, I'm making sure I can page down actually. Why is that not paging down? Oh, there we go, it's on a bit of a delay. So I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at Bristol and uh, I'm gonna take you through these slides. And as I say, I'm gonna focus on performance and productivity in this essential service. Um, uh, what I'm going to pick up is a bit of an introduction to Bristol's history because it's actually really quite uh, interesting as how that sets the scene for our productivity and performance, both challenge and opportunity. So a little bit about Bristol, then into the field productivity and performance. I'm going to pick up our central and support services and then some other topics as transformation and, and diversity. So quite a lot to get through. So let's see how we do. So. Firstly, Bristol's history. Bristol Water is the oldest water company in the country, and it's got a fascinating history. And linking to COVID and the NHS theme, it was founded in 1846. Interestingly, Brunel in Bristol uh, launched a bid uh, to help the city. Bristol itself was the most diseased city in the country, typhoid, dysentery, cholera. So Brunel had a plan to bring or to use water from a spring and supply the well-heeled part of the city in Clifton. Whereas another chap, a philanthropist, William Budd, he had a different plan, a more ambitious plan to bring water from the Mendip Hills into the city. Uh, both went to the Houses of Parliament in 1846 by Act of Parliament. Bristol Water was formed backing not Brunel's bid, but William Budd's bid, bringing the water in was built and that served the city. So our purpose as Bristol Water is to have a positive impact on society and the environment and build trust beyond water. And, and at times of need, essential services like this are never more important. A few stats on Bristol Water. Uh, all of our people are very proud to work for Bristol Water. 90% of our staff are customers too. We're the oldest water company. And interestingly, we're older than the Bristol uh, Clifton Suspension Bridge as well. Brunel then went on to finish that after the bid for uh, uh, the water company. So fascinating history. The area we serve is, is Bristol, but also the surrounding areas. So north up to Tetbury, out to the coast, uh, to Western Supermare, down to Glastonbury and, and across to almost Bath, just the outskirts of, of Bath. So let's jump into productivity and performance Let, and, and why, uh, why am I talking about this and why did I talk about how the company was formed? Well, it's interesting when we look at our values. When I, when, having come to Bristol, the people in Bristol have huge pride in the business, huge pride to provide this essential service to customers. And they've got huge with that support and respect to one another. And like in all good leadership um, uh, uh, situations, those base foundation values are superb. But overplaying those values can, can lead to challenges. So in transforming Bristol Water, we've also brought in the values of being professional, being ambitious, and holding each other to account professionally in terms of our, our service performance. So with that, we then set about establishing uh, the ambition. When I arrived in Bristol, we had failed our leakage target for two years. And leakage in the water industry is a, is a big deal. I'm sure everyone on the line has heard of leakage. And we went from failed leakage target to industry leading in one year, uh, three years ago. And we've stayed there ever since. And you can see there on the chart on the right hand side, how productivity and performance has gone up. And interestingly, it had gone up to where that graph started. But even during COVID, it's at its highest levels in terms of productivity. The dip you see at the end, like that heart trace, is just uh, July, August, where uh, obviously some people take some time out with their family. But how have we done that? Well, we've done that by maintaining uh, and enhancing our performance management drumbeat. So for me, the big underpin here is active management. And, you know, never waste a good crisis. One of the things for me was getting our operations operational managers out in the field, leading their people, looking after their people, but also establishing operational ry rhythms supported by good quality management information. So actually, the pandemic gave us a good excuse to get our managers not working from home, but not working from the office either. Get them socially distanced, leading our people in the ground, on the ground. Give them the right management information and establish performance drumbeats, not only per team, but down to team member levels. And with that, 
uh, you know, one-to-one -one coaching with, you know, quick turnaround cycles to unblock the issues that were slowing their, our people down. And you can see there on the graphic how we've set out and we're on the journey to take the typical split of manager activities on the left-hand side to, to the ambitious side on the right, which shows really the active management of, of people in the field. And the performance and productivity around that is, um, is seen on that graph. And we're, ro we're rolling that out right across the whole business. And also, I can also, uh, you're, you're, you're smart when I say, when you, take, when you take a city like Bristol in the middle of COVID, uh, once you've got over the fact that it's quite eerie driving around the city that is silent, uh, it's good for traffic management, it's good for digging up the roads, and it's good for getting across an otherwise busy city. So that also helps productivity and performance. So uh, uh, I wouldn't want to lose sight of that either. If I then look at central and support services, like most businesses in the UK, even though we're essential service, within a couple of weeks of, the, of, of, of lockdown starting, we, we emptied our office. Everyone went from a, uh, a you know, three, 400 strong head office operation to next to nobody in the office, bar those people who we had to have in the office. We enabled that, like all companies across the UK, with IT systems, processes, but also made sure we're looking after the welfare of our people working from home. That said, it didn't work for all teams. Uh, some teams couldn't work from home, home, such as our control room. Clearly, our field staff were still out in the field. But we've actually brought some teams back into the office, socially distanced, aided by the fact that the majority of people are still working from home, but where in our planning and scheduling and uh, customer and highways teams, actually the communication across those teams is uh, really, really important. We've brought those teams back in so they can really work uh, su suitably distanced, but actually drive those processes from, from the center. We're also transforming the business. So, We've got a huge amount going on in terms of transformation, uh, modernizing Bristol Water and transforming the business. And you can see there on that slide our blueprint, blue, blueprint principles of how we're setting out to change the business. But the takeaway from this slide is not the fact we've got a lot going on with frontline services that I lead and support services that's led by my colleague. The takeaway for me is actually... How did we engage our people without getting them in the conventional big workshop, big auditorium type uh, fashions? And so we've used a lot of video comms, we've used a lot of telecoms, Teams, Zoom, all of those things to be able to have company-wide stand downs, get everybody electronically onto systems, use the executive uh, uh, with regard to videos. And we we're even talking about it before this call, the fact that the use of videos when you're at home, I happen to be in the office today, but when you're at home and the, the dogs go mad because the postman's arrived or my wife seems to have established uh, my house as an Amazon delivery, delivery hub uh, or so on, or a dog parks itself behind me, it gives a wonderful insight. Uh, to uh, to say, you know, a chief operating officer that would normally be conventionally, you know, shirt and tie in an office. It makes people, it's more intimate. It makes it real. So I think that that is a really interesting dimension in terms of unlocking the, you know, the hearts and minds of people that, you know, we're all humans and we all have the challenges uh, and, and uh, a life outside work. And then finally, uh, just to give a completely different angle, and Leah, who's with me, my PA Leah, has really championed this one. We've, we've really promoted diversity, equality and inclusion during this period. And what's been fascinating, actually, is that uh, uh, we, we invited people uh, to share some of their stories. And, and because we're going to share these on the web, I've, I've, we've hidden the faces of the various people. But you can see on there uh, the topics that have been shared uh, uh, my PA Leah is dyslexic. She's really proud of it. Doesn't hold her back, but she shares her story. We've got stories on de depression, PTSD, uh, all kinds of things. And what's been interesting with the values of Bristol and why I started where I started, uh, the the supportiveness and respectfulness has really raised this as uh, as, as a theme. And people are for you know, success breeds success. People are. Uh, coming forward to share their stories. And these stories have more hits on our intranet site than any other story across the company, which I think is actually really tremendous. And at a time of care and welfare and need for people, it's been, a, I have to say, a real hit 
uh, uh, promoting this at this point in time. And, and I'll use Leah's words, Leah's words are on the bottom of this slide, supporting each other to become the best version of themselves that they can be. Now, that has got to be a key and an enabler to productivity and performance. So I won't dwell on this slide, it's on the pack, but it's just an example. And the, the story on the right, Leah's happy and proud to share, which is fantastic, Leah's story on the right-hand side. So uh, it'll be there in the deck for you to look at. So final slide. So in conclusion, for me, productivity and performance has continued throughout the uh, pandemic, continuing our journey. And actually, uh, as I say, never waste a good crisis has been a catalyst in some instances to make changes because we had to. We've enabled people to work from home uh, uh, and the majority of our people who aren't in the field are working from home. But uh, we've brought some back into the office for good reason. But the rest working from home actually protects themselves and the people who work in the office who can't work from home. Transformation has continued through the period as well. Uh, and you can see that's a busy transformation agenda that, he, that he's running at the moment. We've had to innovate in the way we've uh, engaged our people through that transformation. And I should also add some of that transformation is difficult. We're making over 50 redundancies as a result of sharpening up our processes. So, you know, there's tough messages in that transformation as well. And then finally, supporting each other to become the best version of themselves that they can be, I think is hugely powerful. So I'll just leave you with one other opportunity. And that picture in the middle is the highest spot in Bristol. Funnily enough, it's our uh, big water tower at Durdham Down, where I've got one of my construction projects. So it's the highest point in Bristol. And you can see on this cladding on the scaffold there, a big thank you to the NHS and key workers, which, of course, some people have said is thanking ourselves. But it's all the key workers that are keeping this country moving. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you, Richard. And uh, some fascinating stuff in there. Um, uh, I'm impressed you managed to keep a, such a busy and complex transformation programme going during, uh, during lockdown. As we know well, that's very difficult to do in the rest of the world. And uh, the stuff I think you've done on diversity, inclusion, employee engagement is, uh, I'm no doubt, key to the success of that work you've done. I think that's fantastic. So uh, again, if anyone has any questions for Richard, please do add him to the Q&A uh, chat box, uh, Q&A box rather, and then we'll, uh, we'll pick those up at the end of the session. So thanks again, Richard, and thank you for sticking to, to time. And uh, on now to our third speaker and final speaker, who is Alan Bowman. Alan's the founder and a director of The Buzz. And The Buzz is a, a research and insight consultancy we have a partnership with and we've worked with together for over, over 10 years now, I think, Alan. And um, we are, have worked together in, in the health and transport sectors, but The Buzz works in, in, in much broader areas than that as well, particularly FMCG and... Um, I'm sure Alan will, uh, will mention some of the work they've done in, uh, in the process of your discussion. Alan's going to talk about um, some work we've done together that came out of the Smart to Work initiative, particularly about employees, employers being able to engage with the staff, understand how they feel about the changes and what works for them. So uh, again, Alan, thanks for taking the time to talk to us and over to you. Thanks very much, Jonathan and uh, Richard as well. Uh, thank you for, you know, really prefacing a lot of what I'm, I'm going to say. Um, and you know, the enthusiasm with which you delivered it, uh, it was also you know, particularly um, insightful, I think. Uh, you know, it's nice to see senior managers believing in what they do. And the phrase, don't waste a good crisis, uh, is <laughs> definitely one that's going to live on. I need the T-shirt. Um, so let's... Just move on. What's that? Right. Uh, I wanted to start off with this kind of, um, well, an iconic 1936 Chaplin movie called Modern Times. Um, you know, we see here the, the kind of famous little tramp character in a struggling to maintain his work output uh, against a host of sort of automated pressures in a very modernist workplace, you know, maybe some 13 years after. Uh, Metropolis came out as a silent movie as well and the thing about the, the, the film is that everything works in rhythm uh, and only when Chaplin starts to fall behind the preset pace that the machines have set does the real kind of chaos uh, and obviously the comedy ensue. Um, so I chose this image deliberately to introduce the notion that organizations, uh, workplaces, you know, have and evolve a natural rhythm um, it might work through seasonality. Uh, there's the planning cycle and budgeting, um, performance, 
that that needs to be needs to work at different paces because uh, of of you know the need to get products to market quickly and to develop new products. Um, and I think teams, you know, in particular, t- teams work at different speeds. Um, and understanding the cycles at which those uh, those teams work is really key. Uh, and a bit like the machinery you see on the image, you know, they they are cogs in a wheel. Uh, that work at different speeds and, and, and integrate really smoothly because they are usually different sizes. And productivity peaks, I think, when, uh, you know, from a performance point of view, when that natural rhythm is unknown and workers are able to kind of keep up to that beat. Uh, but 2020 has really broken the natural rhythm of work, or, or it's, it's certainly enforced a new beat, you know, as Richard was saying, uh, and indeed, um, we, you know, we've seen other examples that um, that that natural rhythm is, is complete was completely shattered um, and was replaced with, you know, incredible speed at, at one level um, and almost nothing uh, at another. So we've we've got workforces now which are, have fallen into these three broad groups: those who continue to work because they have to, those in the workplace or in the field, um, people who you know, are working from home in a completely new environment, and also a significant number of people who are furloughed. Uh, and we have these, these groups that, that are feeling different things about their world of work, um, you know, maybe confused, maybe feeling slightly selected and special uh, for the people who continue to work in the workplace. Um, Certainly, isolation from people who work from home is a common feedback. Uh, and a sense from people who are furloughed, you know, kind of, why me? Have I been excluded deliberately? So we're now working uh, to a syncopated rhythm, uh, not necessarily a natural rhythm, but something that's been enforced. And, you know, for the musicians amongst the, uh, the audience, you may know what this is, but the, the kind of dictionary definition uh, is that very often um, the syncopated beat uh, is unusual because it stresses those beats in a bar that are normally the unaccented beats. So not the things that that feel natural, but the things that feel a little bit offbeat. Uh, And I think that's, you know, very true of the of the situation that's developed with COVID. We've had to adapt uh, to different ways of working. Some parts of the organisation have uh, really kind of come to the forefront. Uh, and, you know, the, the role that maybe a small cog in the organization plays, played pre-COVID um, is significantly enhanced uh, by their speed of response. And, and as we've seen, you know, the you know, NHS was a great example, you know, as an organization which is often pointed at for being incredibly unproductive and slow to change, um, you know, how quickly has that reacted to the situation uh, that it found itself in? And, and the ongoing situation of being able to manage non-COVID cases uh, and, and try and manage the non-COVID death rate in the way that they're doing. And disparate teams, you know, have become familiar now because geography doesn't matter anymore when you're on screen. Uh, so that whole host of, you know, cloud-based tools, teams, you either love it or hate it. Um, you know, personally, it doesn't work for me, uh, or maybe I don't work for it. I don't know. But you know, it's it's a struggle uh, for for some people to actually adapt to that way of working. I think as well. So, the lessons that we learned from uh, taking part in in the smarter working focus, I think, are really significant. Um, the first acknowledgement that came out from the group really is that everyone's personal circumstances are different. You know, so there is a need to adopt an employee-driven approach rather than implementing one-size-fits-all solutions from the top down. Uh, and in my role, uh, you know, presenting back research findings to a very large organization uh, with about 25, 30 people on screen at the same time was fascinating to see the chief executive uh, in his nice Cotswold purpose-built Neville Johnson office, uh, you know, fully teched out. Uh, and some of the operational people who had needed to, to um, hear the results first hand 
balancing on a kitchen table or even on a, in a, you know on the edge of a bed. Um, so massively different circumstances. Um, there are many complex interconnected issues to be considered clearly, and 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 these would you really benefit from being evaluated on a structured basis. You know, there hasn't been, there wasn't the time, the speed of reaction that was needed as, as you know, uh, Richard particularly demonstrated was it, it changed in a moment, in a heartbeat, uh, the, the working practices and remarkable how quickly uh, organizations adapted. But, you know, we're now seven or eight months on from that and, you know, there's no doubt that the, the world of work has changed. So how do we now start to evaluate and maintain and keep the, the, the productivity gains that we've, we've seen? Um, there was an acknowledgement from the group that, that often the best ideas come from employees themselves and, and they are a new and empowered and listened to group because senior managers were actually having to take the time to to get involved in huddles or uh, work groups um, that, were, that were being conducted on, on uh, screen and being able to, to you know, hear firsthand some of the suggestions and ideas that you know, would probably have got lost within the organization previously. So we felt we should allow a process to develop where leaders can actually discover what colleagues have found to be the best and worst aspects of working from home. And that can be done informally. Uh, it can be done using video and blogs and, and some of the examples, again, that, that Richard sort of indicated in his talk. Um, but there's also another way, and you would expect me to say this, wouldn't you, from a, a research uh, consultancy. But, um, you know, we felt that a survey-led approach, um, which could, first of all, benchmark um, and provide a consistent measure of how different teams have worked, have coped, um, you know, with working from home or working from the office, but with a much reduced uh, uh, workforce. And do that, you know, really with a, a kind of simple self-assessment sort of tool. You know, inclusivity was important uh, and again was highlighted earlier. And we wanted to engage the whole of the workforce and actually understand some of the differences and some of the tensions and friction points um, between those who are furloughed, working from home and working as normal. And the, th the, the kind of third element of this development really was actually to remember to be emotionally intelligent. Uh, and again, sort of echo some of the themes that Richard uh, uh, were, finished his, his uh, talk with but actually show what individuals and teams feel about, not how they rate uh, or how they react to, but how they actually feel about the communication, how connected they are as a workforce, their, their commitment to the cause, to the vision, to the values, um, the ability to cope, you know, coping you know, from an environment point of view uh, and actually, you know, really focus on some of the mental health and wellness uh, issues that, that we believed and, and do believe are a direct result of uh, how we've all been working throughout the pandemic. So certainly a survey needed to be inclusive and these three groups, these three big groups, which are universal in, uh, across many, many organizations, um, give us an opportunity to kind of understand how that syncopated dynamic is working now, both within these groups, so amongst people who have been furloughed um, and between the groups. So the, the inherent tensions between people who were furloughed, those who were continued to work and those who were continued uh, uh, to, be, to work, but in a home situation. So we've developed um, a, you know, a unique survey, yes, uh, a unique survey from the point of view of every organization works to a different beat uh, and therefore it has its own challenges and its own requirements. Um, so you know, our approach is, is to develop a survey you know, for each organization, but which has some key and central elements to it. Uh, and some of those elements are, are unashamedly borrowed from uh, tried and tested uh, techniques that were referred to in the smarter working um, sessions that we had through Journey 4. But as you can see, there are some sort of distinct uh, question areas uh, that can be built into that survey. The important thing is that it's, uh, it, it is committed to 
as a more formal, if you like, as a reference point for managers and teams to be able to understand and work with. And timing's everything. You know, we're now in the situation, I'm in the news today. Uh, I woke up to uh, Professor Van Tam answering questions about deploying the, the vaccine. Um, so we've now got that, that, that news. Uh, and yeah, I suppose everybody's, in, the impact it's had on everybody is that, well, that means we'll, we'll get back to normal again. Not in the world of work, not in my view. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, the timing of getting this kind of knowledge, this kind of insight about the workforce and the workforce dynamics and the pace at which each team is working is really important. Um, you know, a, a bespoke survey, we, obviously we called it syncopation because that's the theme of the talk, but the syncopated survey can be ready to launch within two weeks. Um, but there needs to be some preparation time because the survey needs to be ready to work for the organization that requires it and the characteristics, values and personality of that organization, the teams within it uh, require um, you know, some audit work and some discussion and familiarization before it goes. But certainly uh, a, a turnaround of uh, between three and four weeks and uh, we, you know, we're re ready to go. So if anybody wants details, uh, ending with a sales pitch. You can you can finish uh, you can find those sorry on the Journey Works Work uh, web space just by uh, following the link that's included in the pack that you will get. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate your time. Great, Alan. Thank you very much, and uh, no no shame in the in the sales pitch at the end there either. <laughs> And as, as you finish with uh, timing is everything, I mean, time is everything in terms of uh, businesses planning for how they respond to this uh, situation, not just in the short term, obviously, but what they take out of this as the long term. And that was one of our findings from the um, from the smart working work. You know, one of the difficulties is we're all reacting to what we see. But when do we take the time to now plan for what life will be like as we start to move back to this, the, the new normal, to use that phrase? And um that's obviously a difficult, difficult thing to judge, but as we now start talking about vaccines, we can imagine next year there'll be a gradual transition back to new ways of working that will be a mixture of old ways of working and some of the things we've learned in the last, in the last nine months. So th thanks again, Alan, and thanks again, uh, as all three of you for sticking to time. Uh, the good news is that leaves us some time for, uh, for a Q&A. So um, I've got a couple of questions to, to ask. I'm going to start off, if I can, Alison, with a question for you. So uh, one of the questions, the first one I'm going to ask you is, what do you think the uh, obviously if it weren't for the, the pandemic and the COVID outbreak, do you think the kind of transformation you have seen in managed to achieve at Chesterfield Royal Hospitals would have been uh, achievable? Um, yeah, thanks, Helen, for for that question. Um, I don't think it would, to be perfectly honest. Um, I think the response to COVID has created a um, coordination point. Um, and an energy for change. And as I said, the gates of avoidance were closed. So, you know, for your organisations where people have, are avoiding change, um, the question is, well, why is that? And how can you engage their emotions into creating a solution? So you'll remember um, my first slide said, you know, the in original NHS target was to go to X percent virtual uh, consultations in three years. Um, and, you know, Chesterfield have managed to do that in three to four weeks. Mm. So there are some areas within the NHS where it is appropriate to move more slowly because you are dealing with people's health and, and you're dealing with their life and death situations. But where you know that the process can be improved without any clinical impact, then part of my role as a non-exec is to challenge the execs and say, just get on with it. You know, um, there's a, the, there is a culture of pilot forever within the NHS, uh, we had a proposal come forward about changing pharmacy that had been piloted for two years in another hospital and then implemented for a year. Um, and the exec bringing it forward wanted to pilot it for another two years. Um, and, and the non-execs were like, how many pilots do you need? You know, we know it works, you know, three month pilot for our particular context and situation, and then just get on with it. So. Uh, so part of the non-exec role is challenging that thinking and trying to inject some pace uh, into the NHS operation. But uh, but no, I don't think we would have seen the change 
if it hadn't been for COVID. Delighted to hear you challenge that thinking. So as a business that's worked in NHS for a lot in the past, we get very frustrated with that, the uh, eternal piloting and the uh, not much doing moving on. So that's really good to hear you, you're challenging in that way. Uh, there's a related question to that, Alison, as well. Uh, and um, again, something that we found a, a surreal challenge in the NHS in the past was consistency. You mentioned this, and it's been piloted in one hospital trust, being rolled across to Chesterfield and piloted again. Do, do you think that there would have been um, uh, you know, similar achievements elsewhere in the NHS on the back of your experience? And has, that, has your approach been rolled out to other areas or is everyone doing their, their own thing? Um, so it's quite interesting to see the um, information gap between what the public perceive and how the NHS actually operates. So the, the first answer to your question is the NHS is not a single organisation. It's built up of multiple different provider hospitals, community, mental health, um, GP practices. And so um, the public can have an impression that the NHS is a single organisation and therefore change just disseminates quite naturally um, from one place to another, but that isn't the case. Um, I would say um, part of what has been good about COVID is that the NHS has been a level four um, uh, event, which means that um, patients can be moved around the system, clinicians can be moved around the system. And although there's been quite a lot of uh, what we would say command and control from the Department of Health, that has actually brought more combined working and exchange of ideas um, and you know trying things very quickly and moving them into other locations at a faster pace. So the public may think the NHS is a single organisation, it isn't, but COVID has increased the amount of support and inter-organisation working, which can only be a benefit. Another COVID effect. Yes, okay. thank you for that, Alison. And uh, Richard, if I can turn to you, I've got a question for you, um, particularly around what you think you've learnt from your the way you're communicated differently in, across different teams, and what sort of changes in, in behaviours and communication you think those teams might want to keep in place in the future? Yeah, thanks, Jonathan and uh, Neil. Thanks for the question. And uh, yeah, it's a good one. I, I'm going to pick out three things, really. I, I think empathy first. Uh, because the, we are in unprecedented times and it's empathy in all directions. Really um, uh, being really concerned for our people in the field at times. If you think about the start of the COVID pandemic, we didn't know what we were dealing with. We didn't know what was what was where it was going to go, uh, how it was being transmitted. So our people in the field were very anxious, understandably so, delivering an essential service. Uh, Alan's already picked up our people at home. Some people have studies. Some people have nice environments. Some people are perched on the end of a bed or on a sofa with their laptop on their lap, slowly getting a bad back as a result of, you know, posture and so on. That's really hard as well. Uh, some people have got, you know, situations at home whereby they would love to come to the office. Um, and, uh, and, and therefore, and equally being uh, mindful of people in the office as well. Uh, they're coming to work every day into a, an environment. And in the same way, some people are glad to come into the office, other people aren't. So I think firstly, it's real deep empathy and understanding of people's personal circumstances. I'd also say keep, keep things grounded. Let's keep it real. And I think the, the different way we've communicated has really helped that. We're all real people. We all have lives. We all have kids who want to disturb the video conferences and dogs and, you know, dogs that want to eat the postman when he arrives in the middle of a, you know, a, a, a discussion. Uh, you know, I think that helps keep it real. And then, and then also um, think about the future. You know, do we go back to normal? Uh, what is the new normal? There's a lot to embrace about a better work-life balance, both from the environment, in other words, less traffic on the roads and less commuting, commuting and less downtime just to getting from A to B. How can we facilitate a new normal post-vaccine uh, that, that uh, enables us to keep the good things about the uh, new ways of working that we've had to uh, embrace over the, uh, over the pandemic. Uh, so there's so much, uh, and I could go on, but I'll, I'll pause there. That's great. Thank you, Richard. I really appreciate that. And I, and I thank you for taking up Work-Life Balance, which is the subject of our, of our third webinar, which I do think is a, is a key find that's come out of this whole, this whole process. There are things we've all gave we want to keep on there, and that, that being uh, keeping it real is, is a very good way of uh, phrasing that. 
So the final question, I'm just going to put a question to, to you, Alan, quickly, if I can. Um, a question we've had about, obviously, any special considerations for how we look at people who've been working from home who are, who are new starters and who perhaps never met their, uh, their colleagues. Um, this is something that we found particularly relevant because uh, we just, we've got two clients now we've mobilised during lockdown and we've never actually met as well as some of the people working on those clients. So uh, any considerations from your perspective on how you can um, understand those people's perspectives? Yeah, I think I think um, I, I've similarly had uh, two clients that have started in a role, uh, you know, in marketing and product development roles, never met the people that they they uh, have to work with on a day to day basis, other than on screen. Um, and a lot of it is down to the to the you know seniority of the position and the personality of the person in that job role, but. I think onboarding and uh, induction processes, you know, have also you know, worked, changed and worked at, at speed to to make the, the you know the use of video and and um, team huddles seems to be the thing. Uh, huddle groups or daily huddles are, is something that I, I, I hear regularly, and it, and it's using a whole range of social media to try and and welcome somebody new into into the group, but. Because you never know when all you're seeing is a face on the screen, you doubt, you don't actually know what's going on behind the eyes, as it were. And I think you know the benefit of, of um, using a kind of survey tool that's very interactive actually gives those people a voice in the same way as their more experienced colleagues. And actually looking at them as a cohort of new starters, if if it's a big organisation, uh, is is actually really really important because you know they will find the um, the, the, the post-vaccine scenario probably very different you know you, you've been working for an organization potentially for nearly a year but you don't know the way the organization functions when it's together uh, and I think you know there's there is some danger in in not actually being uh, having a view of what's going on behind the eyes of those people uh, in advance which is why as, as I say the the, the informal um, HR-led touch points, uh, some of which Richard mentioned, are really useful. But you also need to know, you know, be able to measure in the way that productivity should be measured, whether it's working or not. Uh, and I think the only way you can do that is to ask people in a in a spirit of um, um, confidentiality. Uh, and asking them as individuals and then looking at how those responses aggregate across teams and groups and locations and methods of working, etc. Great. Great. Thank you, Alan. And thank you to all the panellists for your answering to those questions. Thank you to our viewers um, for, for listening throughout the webinar and for your crazy back-to-back -back Zoom team calls. <laughs> so I just want to uh, obviously hope you found that useful and some very great insights there, I think, into how particularly essential services businesses have re responded and managed to use the, uh, the crisis, never wasted it to, to find, obviously, uh, ways to improve productivity. So uh, my final thanks are to the three panellists, to Alison, to Richard and Ellen for your time and for sharing your insights. And uh, thanks again, and um, I wish you all a, a, very, uh, a very good day. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.